and uh, even people that understand grace and forgiveness in Jesus, we have a tendency to either throw them completely away or try and earn our salvation by keeping them. And those are both equally dangerous uh, struggles. So we're going to try and understand what uh, the New Testament would call God's law. And that's the, the Ten Commandments, the Ten Words. So if you would prayerfully be preparing for that study, uh, I would appreciate that. Please pray for me and also pray for our church as we study uh, God's Word together and uh, try and learn more about His law and uh, grow in grace together. So our, um, our call to worship this morning comes from a psalm that's particularly uh, close to my heart and uh, several other uh, friends of mine. Uh, David in this psalm is reflecting on the saving and the rescuing power of God. Uh, there was a particular moment in David's life where he was rescued and he knew that God alone had done that. And that is the beautiful psalm that we know as Psalm 34. And that's going to be our call to worship text this morning. So if you have known salvation today, if you're a believer, then this psalm will definitely ring true in your ears. Hear these words and think of what Christ has done on your behalf, how he has saved you out of great trouble. But if you're here and maybe you're not a believer, maybe you're weary, uh, maybe you're fearful this morning, I want you to listen to this psalm and especially the last few lines, which will deserve extra attention from you this morning. Uh, so as I read this, let's think of how our God has delivered us, church, and let this call your hearts to worship. Psalm 34. I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise shall continually be in my mouth. My soul makes its boast, where? In the Lord. Let the humble hear and be glad. Oh, magnify the Lord with me and let us exalt his name together. I sought the Lord and he answered me. And he delivered me, delivered me from all my fears. Those who look to him are radiant. Think about that. And their faces shall never be ashamed. This poor man cried, and the Lord heard him and delivered and saved him out of all his troubles. The angel of the Lord encamps around those who fear him and delivers them. And here's the word for you, church. Oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is the man who takes refuge in him. Amen, church. All praise is truly due him this morning. Amen. If you believe that, we're going to sing that song together. Will you stand with us? All praise to our God.
end back with praise this morning. This is one of my favorite hymns ever written, and I trust that we as believers can uh, agree with the words of this song. How marvelous, how wonderful is the love that we've been shown by our Savior. So if you believe that, about that love this morning, can we sing this hymn together? I stand I hope and pray that you never get over that. What a Savior, what love that, we, that he has bestowed upon us that we should be called the sons of God. And so praise the Lord for the singing this morning. Thank you so much, church family, for not only coming and fellowshipping, but us ministering in song together and to each other. 
I hope you realize that we're not just lifting our voices, but we're lifting our voices towards each other. We are singing the gospel to one another. So with that in mind, let me give you a few announcements, or not announcements, but prayer requests. Um, let's continue remember Ms. Gail Scruggs um, in, our, in our prayers. Um, Ms. Gail is a shut-in. She's a member of our church, and so let's remember her this morning in our time of prayer, but also... Um, I ask just over the next couple of months that you be praying particularly for our church leadership and committees as we're doing a lot of planning for the upcoming fiscal year. And so just be praying for wisdom, just clarity on a lot of items that are going to be in discussion that we'll be bringing to the membership. And so just be praying for that. I just praise the Lord last week. What a wonderful members meeting that we had together. Just harmony and community, great fellowship, also just uh, bearing burdens amongst the member membership, but also just um, being able to just celebrate what God's been doing in our midst. And so very thankful for that. And um, one more request. Um, just this is probably more personal um, for me, but also I recognize this for our church body. Um, some of you are in the midst of making decisions, and, and you need greatly wisdom from the Lord. And you need knowledge. Now, we all need that, right? But don't we have circumstances and times in our life where it becomes even more evident? So let's be praying for that as a church family, that we will walk in wisdom, that we will seek the Lord and recognize and embrace the truth from his word, that he says that if anyone lacks wisdom, let him ask of God, who gives liberally. And that we recognize that whatever God gives us, it is good, because every good gift comes from above. So today, as we go to the Lord in prayer with these needs, let's be mindful of those, recognizing that everything that we ask, that we ask in the will of the Father, He will hear and He will answer. Let's pray with confidence this morning together. Father in heaven, you are God and there is none like you. We glory in that, for you are our strength. You have told us to remember the wondrous works that you have done. And we are doing that today and singing praises, all praise to you. And we give thanks. We express our gratitude by calling on your name and recalling the mercies of your hand. You never promise, you never make a promise that you will not keep. And you will never fail, regardless of how small and insignificant we might appear, Lord, with with adoration today and confidence we declare we are your people and we have been loved before the foundations of the earth and we have been redeemed by the precious blood of your son and father we could not go this time without lord recognizing um, the time the season that we are in to which we are um, allowed by your sovereign hand to live in a land to which we have been afforded the opportunity to worship corporately and freely together. Where we honestly are so spoiled by the abundance of resources. Where our problems are mostly simple inconveniences compared to so much of the world. So we pray as Christians and we offer thanksgiving continually to you and we pray, God, that you will also give us clarity to be a continual, grateful people. Encouraging others to look towards heaven and say, praise God from whom all blessings flow. Indeed, we are mindful that all of this has come from your hand. And Lord, during this time where there is, Lord, a celebration of declaration of our independence from other nations, May we be drawn more, though, to utter dependence on you. Prone to wonder, are we, and prone to believe in the lies of our own hearts that we can pursue self-sufficiency. Lord, we repent of that inclination. And because, Lord, even this week we have sinned, we have failed, and we have doubted. We have not been as who we are in Christ. We have not lived that way. We have loved the world and ignored your word. We have forgotten you by thinking so much of ourselves. Please forgive us. We ask for your mercy and your grace in our helplessness. 
Lord, we have mentioned needs already. Miss Gail, our church leadership. And Lord, even individuals right now who are wrestling with wisdom and clarity. Lord, we just lean on you. For Lord, we are a needy people. And we bring supplication to you. We pray in total humility this morning. We need nourishment and protection. We need security, a sense of affection. We ask these things because you have promised these things to your people. And it is based on the fact that we know that our Heavenly Father cares for us. That's why we can pray in confidence. And in a few moments, we will continue our study, wrapping up a section in the Gospel according to Matthew. Looking closer, not just to the earthly ministry of Jesus, but to his teachings to a hostile religious system. I pray, God, that you will challenge us and encourage us, mature us through your word. And Lord, we offer thanks for the singing, for the writing of songs that are theologically sound and doctrinally correct. And Lord, in a moment, we will sing even more of your good character how you are the very essence of goodness. Lord, as we lift our voices, may we not do it with hypocrisy. May the notes and the lyrics pour out of our hearts as we are confident in your promises. Because that's why we have gathered. And that's even now why we give. And I pray, God, that as we give, it is not out of law, but it is out of sincere love. Lord, we are smitten by you. We are amazed. And that is why we dedicate this time, this day, this week in our lives to you. And we conclude this prayer by praying and proclaiming the name which is above every name. And that is the name of Jesus Christ the righteous. And together the church says, Amen. Amen.
praise for his goodness to us this morning. Amen. You can be seated. Our scripture reading this morning comes from Matthew chapter 23, verses 13 through 39. But woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you shut the kingdom of heaven in people's faces, for you neither enter yourselves nor allow those who enter to go in. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you travel across the sea and land to make a single proselyte, and when he becomes a proselyte, you make him twice as much a child of hell as yourselves. Woe to you, blind guides, who say, If anyone swears by the temple, it is nothing. But if anyone swears by the gold of the temple, he is bound by his oath. You blind fools, for which is greater, the gold or the temple that has made the gold sacred? And you say, If anyone swears by the altar, it is nothing. But if anyone swears by the gift that is on the altar, he is bound by his oath. You blind men, for which is greater, the gift or the or the altar that makes the gift sacred. So whoever swears by the altar swears by it and everything on it. And whoever swears by the temple swears by it and by him who dwells in it. And whoever swears by heaven swears by the throne of God and by him who sits upon it. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you tithe mint and dill and cumin and have neglected the weightier matters of the law, justice and mercy and faithfulness. These you ought to have done without neglecting the others. You blind guides, straight out, straining out a gnat and swallowing a camel. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites! For you clean out the out, you clean the outside of the cup and the plate, but inside they are full of greed and self-indulgence. You blind Pharisees, first clean the inside of the cup and the plate, that the outside also may be clean. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees! Hypocrites, for you are like whitewashed tombs, which outwardly appear beautiful, but are within, but within are full of dead people's bones and all uncleanness. So you also outwardly appear righteous to others, but within you are full of hypocrisy and lawlessness. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you build the tombs of prophets and decorate the monuments of the righteous, saying, If we had lived in the days of our fathers, We would not have taken part with them in shedding the blood of the prophets. Thus you have witnessed again yourselves that you are sons of those who murdered the prophets. Fill up, then, the measure of your fathers, you serpents, you brood of vipers. How are you to escape being sentenced to hell? Therefore I send you prophets and wise men and scribes, some of whom you will kill and crucify, some you will flog in your synagogues and persecute from town to town. So that on you may come all the righteous bloodshed on earth, from the blood of righteous Abel to the blood of Zechariah, the son of Berechiah, whom you murdered between the sanctuary and the altar. Truly I say to you, all these things will come upon this generation. O Jerusalem, Jerusalem, the city that kills the prophets and stones those who are sent to it. How often would I have gathered your children together as hens, as a hen gathers her brood under her wings, And you are not willing? See, your house is left to you desolate. For I tell you, you will not see me again until until you say, Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. This is God's word. Amen. All right, at this time we'll dismiss our children to child care. Thankful for all of them and thankful for our teachers who are investing in them this week. It's a blessing to to be able to see all of them. Thank you parents for bringing them and uh, so that they could observe. 
God's people singing praises to him, praying together, fellowshipping, and uh, now also reading scripture together. And so we're thankful for that. As Matt has already mentioned, we are um, about to take a break from our study in the book of Matthew. This week marks the 76th week um, that we have been studying in this book. And uh, it has been a journey. Um, this is the first time uh, that I have had the opportunity to go through um, the, one of the Gospels uh, in a verse-by-verse study. And it has been a blessing um, to me. And I am looking forward to getting back into the study as we're going to take a break here. And uh, Pastor Matt has already emphasized that he will be taking a great bulk of the pulpit pulpiteering uh, over the next couple of months as he's going to be going through the 10-word study. And I'm excited about that together, and I'm excited about being able to participate um, more with you in some other areas of the ministry over the next couple of months and focus in on that as we're working on structuring things and um, really getting things geared up for the fall. And so it has been a blessing. Well, those Pharisees and scribes, every once in a while they pop up here in the Gospels, and Jesus has to address their teaching, the religious system that they have implemented. Today, is the, today will mark for us the last time we will encounter a direct confrontation and teaching ministry element of Jesus regarding the Pharisees and the scribes. And even his, any dialogue with them. We'll reference that a little bit later in the sermon, but let me give you a little bit of context. Last week, Jesus has now um, spoken to the crowd, and this is his last time that he will be teaching in, in a sort of mixed audience, meaning that there are Pharisees, scribes, their religious leaders, that there are people of the crowd that just come out of curiosity, and his disciples, that mixed crowd there. Primarily, Jesus is teaching from henceforth will be solely to his disciples. It will be in more intimate settings. He will be um, talking about what is to be expected in his return. We'll see that in the next couple of chapters when we come back together. We also know that we are in the mid part of Passion Week. So we're in Tuesday night, Wednesday, um, depending on who you read behind in the historical facts. And so we're in the mid portion of the week. There's not much time left. Jesus is going to be giving a lot of truth here in the next couple of days, particularly to his disciples. And as I said, this is his last interaction with the scribes and the Pharisees with this. Last week, we looked at the, that the characteristics of a Pharisaical ministry, hypercritical and hypocritical, as he calls them even here seven times, hypocrites. And last week we looked that even a group of people that believe themselves to be sincere in their religious convictions run the danger of spiritual deception. They run the danger of being, it being present even in their own lives. It is very much real. In this case, Jesus has been peeling back the curtain and exposing a type of religious activity that displays astounding discipline. Now, can I pause there for a moment? We need to recognize today that these individuals, these groups of religious leaders that Jesus has been talking to, has been preaching to, has been teaching, lived a lot more disciplined lives than you and I live. They were, they were down to the point, down to the minute detail. And they would carry things out and create hedges to protect themselves from breaking God's law externally. They were very disciplined. Jesus is exposing this astounding discipline though. Because deep down, they were doing these things in preservation for their own power, for their own well-being, and for their own influence. Can we take that for a moment? And let us not, as we sometimes feel like we do, just beat up on the Pharisees. But can we identify with them for a moment? Recognizing that deep down inside of us still lingers a Pharisaic mentality. 
Meaning that we desire to be seen as strong. We desire to be influential. We desire to have the prominence. We desire to be seen as righteous. Not just to others, but even to God and even to ourselves. We need to understand, as we will emphasize today, that Jesus isn't attacking their traditions. He's attacking why they're doing their traditions. So introduction today, I think we can already feel the tone. This is the most aggressive teaching concerning the religious leaders to this day. Jesus is now bringing out woes. Well, blessed, remember in chapter 5, 6 and 7, but particularly in chapter 5, the Beatitudes, blessed are they. We talked about how most prophets, when they would come on the scene, and then when they had something to give to the people, most of the time it wasn't very good news. And it would begin with woes because of a burden that had been placed on them. Jesus, preaching that Sermon on the Mount, comes in and declares blessedness to his people. And he says, blessed are they. And so we looked at that word blessed, makara. And and it it is a positive judgment by God on an individual. And it means that they are approved. Or to find approval. So when God blesses, when he says blessed are they, he means approved are they. The prophets of the Old Testament sometimes would rejoice to proclaim God's act of mercy in the past. Delivering his people and individuals from their enemies and from disasters of all kinds. They delighted to reassure God's people that he was present with them and that the Holy One of Israel was in their midst and that presence was mighty. They strained to express his promises of future deliverance and wisdom and victory. Isaiah said this, The wolf will lie down with the lamb. The earth will be filled with the knowledge of God as the waters Cover the sea. The prophets, although times bearer of bad news, gloried at the times when they could indeed express God's blessing on his people. Blessed are God's people. We see it. We see the promises even of Jesus in the Sermon on the Mount that they will be experiencing an unending comfort, that they will be inheriting this earth That they will be experiencing complete satisfaction with righteousness and justice. That they will receive divine mercy. And they are promised, they are promised to see God. They will be called the very children of God. The earth and the kingdom of heaven will be their inheritance, joint heirs with Christ. And he promises and assures his people, great is your reward in heaven. Oh, to be amongst the blessed. Blessed are they. Because it means not just that we get stuff, but the greatest blessing of them all is that it means that we're his children. We're not just citizens of the kingdom. We're children of the king. But woe here, as we see in this text, now is of a negative promise. It's not, have you ever heard that before where somebody, you know, they're talking sternly with somebody. Maybe you you saw it in a movie and they're talking stern with them and they say, whoa, whoa, is that a threat? And how do they respond? No, it's a promise. Jesus is not only giving, is not giving a threat here. He's giving a promise. A woe is an exclamation of grief similar to what is expressed By the word, alas. In pronouncing woes, Jesus was prophesying judgment. It's settled. It will happen to the religious elite who are guilty of hypocrisy and various other sins. 
They had also proclaimed divine warnings, these prophets in the Old Testament. We've alluded to woes. Habakkuk would proclaim woe to God's people. Divine warnings of awful consequences of the continual breaking of God's law by both individuals and nations. So it wasn't just an individual promise of judgment, but it was a corporate promise of judgment. The people were longing, however, for the day of the Lord by the prophets because they viewed judgment strictly being for the enemies of God. The prophets would be quickly to, would quickly remind that there would also be judgment on those who would stand with the enemies of God, even if they were descendants of Israel. Amos said, "Well, alas for the day." The reactions to the prophecies would alter their expressions whenever those like Ezekiel would say, "Woe, O Lord." Alas, and the reactions would be by the prophets a burden that would be in their countenance and would be in their souls for the people of God. And this passage that we're coming to now is God's official rejection of these religious leaders of Israel. Jesus uses the phrase, woe to you, in this text seven times. These words invoke Old Testament prophets to pronounce judgment on Israel. On those who align themselves and call themselves the people of God. The Pharisees who heard these sayings, woe to you, fully understood that Jesus was not just teaching now. Jesus was prophesying. And this would come with great weight. And as we will see in chapters the Pharisees would go away and not to interact with Jesus until he is put on trial. For now they will come together and conjure up a plan in which they can falsify information to be able to crucify this one who professes to be the king, the one who has come. We've referenced the number seven today. We know that Matthew is, has given us a, a lesson on biblical theology using the number seven oftentimes as completion. Now, I recognize that some translations actually have eight woes. Now, that is not adding to the Scripture. They're not breaking the very warnings that are found in the Scriptures of adding to. For Mark and Luke cite the warning that's found in verse 14. We'll get to that in a moment. But we believe that the original manuscripts, the earliest of manuscripts, only show seven here in Matthew 23. We'll elaborate on that eighth one for, short, for a short amount of time here in just a moment because we do not believe that it is anything that is con contradicting the text itself. But Matthew would use the number seven here because it is a complete and utter judgment Nothing will be missed. But today we're also going to look at this text. And it's not only going to be a time to serve and really look at what came to be with the warnings here or, or the prophesying of judgment. But I believe also that Jesus is giving us seven dangers about this religious system that it would be very healthy for us to evaluate in our own lives. So number one... Let me give you these specific dangers quickly. Number one, this religious system brings people to the door, but it doesn't have a key. He says in verse 13, Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, you hypocrites! For you shut the kingdom of heaven in people's faces. For you neither enter yourself nor allow those who would enter to go in. The job of those Pharisees and scribes, remember, the scribes were the experts of the law. They were the ones who would write, and they knew it word by word, jot and tittle. They would go through it. And the Pharisees would serve as more of the interpreters of the law. 
They were the theologians. They were the ones that would not only give the theological statements, but the practical statements of how to go and how to apply this into life. And as generations would go on, the Pharisees kept adding more and more and more hedges to the law. To the place that now, whenever they would have proselytes, as we would we'll talk about in just a moment, as they have these that come to the faith of Judaism, they, were, they knew the hedges so well, but they would miss the heart of what the law was really all about. You see, it was the jobs of these men to show the people the ways of the kingdom of heaven and that they should that they would come to faith in and obedience in God. Instead, they built and enforced a mountain of additional rules while securing their own power. They built these rules and these hedges around the law and then defined themselves as like, hey, by doing this, this makes us look even more spiritual. Why? Because the people couldn't keep the laws. And so by, they gloried in the fact that they were the ones that were able to uphold not only the law of God in their minds, but the traditions in which they had set. Jesus has already alluded to this. They tied burdens to the people that they could not bear. So they would dangle the concept of the kingdom of heaven, but they didn't have a key to the door. And sadly, the door would be shut on so many who would become devout followers of these religious leaders. Number two, we referenced this earlier. It's verse 14 in many translations. It says, Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites! For ye devour widows' houses, and for a pretense make long prayers. Therefore, ye receive a greater condemnation. Number two, we see another danger of this religious system. And that is this religious system approaches the needy, but it preys on their vulnerability. They were able to go to those who were needy and they would acquire of them to give what they had. They would tell them that, listen... That, that you are to give more and to give more and to give more and to live this righteous life. And then they would get discouraged and they would think to themselves, if I can't give, I mean, if I can't do these laws, maybe I can just give more. And the Pharisees and the scribes and the religious leaders would encourage all of this. It's a side note for us today. Mark and Luke expound on this even more. But they would, they would be approachable. To those who were defenseless. Only to gain their trust and then to take advantage of the fact that they're vulnerable. Sadly today false religions do the exact same thing. They're very open and embracing to those who are vulnerable. To those who are hurting. As a personal testimony in my own family. I've shared some before. That I had a family member who struggled mightily with health but would listen to prosperity gospel preachers on TV and would negate buying medicine because she would send so much much to those prosperity gospel and would receive those things in the mail, promises of healing, only to greatly stumble health-wise. You see, she was embraced by a religious system. But they preyed on her vulnerability. We see this in cults and false religions other, in other places. But let us move on. Verse, or number three. This religious system seeks to convert outsiders, but ends up breeding extremists. In verse 15 it says, Woe to you, scribes, Pharisees, hypocrites! For you travel across sea and land... To make a single proselyte. Can we stop there for just a moment? This is hyperbole. But he, what he was saying here is that you will go out of your way to convert people to your religious system. 
I mean, you will do everything you possibly can to gain one more follower for them to convert out of whatever religious system following they have, or even if they're in Judaism, but for them to become even more devout. But Jesus then says and shows us a reality that we can even see even in our own faith, but in other religions as well today. He says, but, and, but when they become a proselyte, you make them, him twice as much a child of hell as yourself. What does Jesus mean here? Jesus is, say, is showing us the danger of religious system whenever you bring people in and you teach them so much of the externals that they don't ever get the heart. Haven't you seen this before? Can we stop for a moment just even in our own context here? Not necessarily comparing it to this, but the reality of this. So maybe it will identify or maybe we can identify with it a little bit. Have you ever seen someone who is maybe... we? saved out of, we would call, grotesque sin. That, that maybe they, and, that, and then whenever, man, when they get Jesus, they get Jesus. And they become so passionate. Next thing you know it, they're more passionate people than, than people that have been in the church for 20, 30 years. Man, they just got the zeal, right? And by the way, we should praise the Lord for that zeal. But with zeal, we need wisdom. And that's why we are a community. And oftentimes, you will find those who get a zeal for God's word or a zeal for the church or for a religious system. A lot of times what they do is they get a zeal for rules or they get zeal for um, plights or obligations. They get zeal for how they are to maintain this level of religiosity. They get zeal for all of this. And next thing you know, do you know what they end up doing? They create their own island. And don't you see this in other religions? Sadly, you see it where people come in and they become more passionate about about the religion than the one that even converted them to it. That's what Jesus is saying here. You sought to bring people into your own rules, and now there's people out there that are trying to keep the rules even harder than y'all. They're, they're more passionate about it, and they have missed the heart. They are extremists to your religious system that you have put in place. This certainly is a danger of this religious system that Jesus is confronting. Number four, this religious system promotes truth but enables dishonesty and inconsistency. Woe to you, blind guides. Now, can I stop for a moment? There are people who are who do not have their sight, and they are capable and able to do amazing things. It is, it is unbelievable. Some of you even know some people who do not have their sight. It's amazing how other senses like come to life and are, are even more lively. And it's like, it's, it's just amazing. But blind people aren't meant to be God's. See, he not only says that they're blind, but he says, but the indictment is that they're blind guides. That you are trying to lead people down a path that you have no idea how to travel down. He says, if anyone swears by the temple, it is nothing. But if anyone swears by the gold of the temple, he's bound by his oath. That's the blind guides that say that. You see the inconsistency there? Matt preached on that in the Sermon on the Mount about how they were taking oaths lightly and how then they would, they would have these inconsistent rules and regulations with that and say, okay, now look, now if you, promise about, if you promise on the temple, okay, but if you were to break it, at least you didn't, at least you didn't promise with the gold, the tangible, the valuable stuff that's in the temple. If you swear on the altar, okay, and you didn't keep your word, well, at least you didn't swear by the gifts that are put on the altar. You see, they would claim a need for truth, but they would make provisions for dishonesty and inconsistencies. 
And whoever swears by the altar swears by everything on it. And whoever swears by the temple swears by it and by him who dwells in it. What is he saying here? Look, when you make a promise to someone, it doesn't matter what you put on top of it. In fact, you as believers today, you shouldn't. Listen, we should be known as people who keep our word. We shouldn't have to get constant validation or reassurance from people. They should be so confident that they say, listen, they are a follower of Jesus Christ. They are a believer, a disciple. They are, they are true to their word. They will be true to their word. Cross my heart, hope to die, stick a needle in my eye. We shouldn't have to do that. Jesus here says that you promote truth. But you've enabled dishonesty and technicalities that's created all inconsistency in this religious system of yours. Number five. This religious system majors on the minors, but minors on the majors. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites. For you tithe mint and dill and cumin and have neglected the weightier matters of the law. Justice and mercy and faithfulness. These you ought to have done without neglecting the others. You blind guides straining out a gnat and swallowing a camel. You see, the Israelites were commanded to tithe. Give 10% of certain specific crops. These included oil and grain and wine, according to Deuteronomy chapter 14 and Leviticus chapter 27. It even goes a little bit further, specifying seeds of the land and fruit from the trees and animals of the herd. The Pharisees had chosen to apply these requirements to even the tiniest of the garden plants including mint and dill and cumin. Jesus doesn't condemn their choice, by the way. In fact, he says that aspect of their obedience was legitimate. At the same time, it is an example of the lengths that the Pharisees went to to impose on the people for them to try to obtain legalistic perfection. In focusing on these details, though, the Pharisees became very insensitive to other portions of the law. Obedience was important, of course, but just as important it is to know that the purpose of the regulations of God's law was for His people to be known for justice, mercy, and faithfulness. Without those end goals, all those rules became mere religious exercises instead of a way to accomplish the will of God for His people. And here, don't we see that? Have you ever experienced that justification? Maybe perhaps you've even justified that in your own life. Perhaps you, you think that you can be a jerk to people because you give a lot of money to the church. Perhaps you think that you can hold a debt over someone's head. Not necessarily a, a monetary debt. I'm talking about maybe you're holding something over their head because of the way they treated you in the past. Because of maybe the way you did this. And you justify that in your own mind. Maybe not verbally. And maybe you don't talk to yourself this way. But maybe there's something in you that comforts yourself that you can do that. Why? Because you come to church every single Sunday. Because you get those pins in Sunday school. Or because you have, a, you have a, a piety about you. You have a religious upbringing. That can't be matched by anybody else in the church. Perhaps you look at those things and you look at those as tools to justify you to major on minor things. So that you can minor on the major things. 
this is a characteristic of this religious system. Looking at all those little things, what did he say? Gagging at the gnats. You see that straining? (sighs) What's he talking about here? There was actually a, a pharisaical debate going on in that day. The debate would, they would actually have Pharisees and, um, and religious leaders get up and they would debate on things like this. If, if, a, if a gnat were to fly into your cup of water and, you, and then flies out, is the water unclean and unfit to drink now? Is it sinful for you to drink that cup of water? They would, have, they would have these type of debates. Jesus is referencing these, these type of debates that they would have. He says, he's like, and the problem is you say the water's unclean. Nowhere in the scriptures, in the law, does it say that a, that a gnat is unclean. Good gracious, what did John the Baptist eat? Locusts. He says, nowhere in the scriptures, you are fussing about gnats. But you're swallowing unclean animals like camels. He's using an analogy here to capture their attention. He says, y'all are over here putting putting down your cup of water that a gnat had flown into for a moment. But you're over here scarfing down the unclean animal. Majoring on the minors. Minoring on the majors. Number six. Another danger of this religious system is that it prioritizes outward cleanliness but is inwardly corrupt. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you clean outside of the cup and the plate. But inside, they are full of greed and self-indulgence. You blind Pharisee, first clean the inside of the cup and the plate, and that outside also may be clean. Imagine with me for a moment. You come home and your spouse has cleaned the outside of the plate and the outside of the cup, and it is supper time. And they come and they they sit your plate down in front of you. And they say, close your eyes. And you close your eyes. And they said, I've spent all day cleaning, making sure that these these plates are ready for this. And just, I mean, I hope you're so proud of me. That's something that I would do. I'd be like, honey, I washed the dishes, you know. Just a little bit of affirmation. And they say, now open your eyes. And you look down. And there's rat pellets. And there is, there is dirt. And right in the middle, there's a piece of meat. But all around it and on top of it, it's dirty. And then when you look into your cup, that cup hadn't been cleaned on the inside. And pure filtered water you thought would be inside of it. It is muddy water that might as well have tadpoles living in it. Now... We look at this and we, I would ask you, would you drink out of that cup? Would you eat that meat on that plate? Some of you say, it depends how hungry I am. But, <laughs> but the, the truth lies here. The answer is, it doesn't make sense to clean the outside and not address the inside. Now, for those who, antinomian, remember we talked about antinomian, anti-law last week, okay? For those of you who may kind of lean on the antinomian side, remember everybody leans one way. There's only one person in the entire, that's ever lived on the earth that was perfectly balanced, and that was Jesus. We kind of lean one way or the other. Maybe you lean antinomian today, and maybe you kind of lean a little bit, maybe too hard. You need to understand Jesus here didn't say that you don't address the outside of the cup. He actually says that it will be clean after the inside is addressed. 
Now, we'll talk about the cleaning of that and how it takes place in just a few moments. But the religious system of, that Jesus is addressing here, that, we're, that contextually we are confronting and being confronted about, is a religious system that has prioritized outward cleanness and has ignored the inside of the cup or the, the inside of the plate. This is what the Pharisees were guilty of. Jesus has addressed this over and over again already. Number seven. To play alongside that, this religious system has beauty but has no life. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites. For you are like whitewashed tombs, which outwardly appears beautiful, but within is full of dead people's bones and all uncleanness. Jews weren't supposed to touch dead bodies. And so there's, he's saying here when he points in this uncleanness, it's kind of referencing back to how they've been, they've been so passionate about all these minor things. But now here he's saying the truth of the matter is you are unclean. You are dead. There is no life. Ezekiel, what did he say? What was the vision that was seen? That the Spirit of God would breathe, breathe life. In those dead men's bones. And they would raise up. What is Jesus saying here? Jesus saying is. There is no life that has been breathed into you. Despite outward appearances. These hypocrites have hearts which are disgusting. In this era. The caves and the rock piles used for tombs. Were regularly painted and washed white with lime. Some were even artful memorials built over graves. But at the end of the day, what Jesus is saying is it doesn't matter how beautiful it looks on the outside. It doesn't change the fact that there's just dead men's bones inside of it. He is describing this religious system because in the same way, the Pharisees appeared to be the most unstained of all the Israelites. But inwardly though, Jesus described them full of death. In this way, they are like the cups that he described in the previous world. Clean on the outside, but filthy on the inside. Lastly, so we can get to our conclusion. This religious system refutes history, but inevitably repeats it. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you build the tombs of the prophets and decorate the monuments of the righteous. He's using play on words here, just use the describing of the Pharisees themselves as whitewashed tombs. And now he's talking about how they would even, he's like, you know how you decorate those those tombs as monuments, saying that if we had lived in those days, remember the Israelites had treated the prophets so bad, persecuted them, killed them. They say that if we had lived in those days of our fathers, we we would not have taken part of the shedding of the blood of the prophets. You know what Jesus is saying? Bull butter. Thus you witness against yourself by saying you're their sons. You still identify with them. They murdered the prophets. So fill up then the measure of your fathers. You keep going. You're following down the same line as your fathers. You say you wouldn't have done it to them. You participated and enabled Herod to do it to John the Baptist. And Jesus here, if we can use commentary for a moment, Jesus knows their heart. He says, and you're about to do it to me. And then he says, he he takes from John the Baptist, you serpents, you brood of vipers. How are you to escape the sentence of hell? He is telling that man he is on thick now about judgment with them. He calls them the brood of vipers. I don't know about you, but for the longest time, we talked about this um, just a few chapters ago. But I'll remind you, number one, I hate snakes. 
Everybody knows I hate snakes. If you're with me and there's a snake, I don't have to outrun the snake, just got to outrun you. Okay? And so, I, and, I, and I'm going to tell you, I am going to outrun you. <laughs> but when I think about vipers, I don't know why I think about these big snakes. I think about cobras, something like that. But actually, the vipers that are being discussed here and described by Jesus were actually rather small snakes. They were, des- they were desert snakes. They were snakes that, would, that you would easily confuse because they would sit still. That, that, if, that if you were cleaning up a brush or something, it would be very easy for you to grab one of them and because you would think that they were a stick, just a stick or a twig. But they were very poisonous. And there have been times people would grab a snake. You see that example for Paul in the book of Acts. Remember what happened around the fire where he gets bit? Okay, he got bit by a viper. And so they would move these snakes and they would bite. But at times they would, they would overcome an area so much that what they would have to do is they'd have to burn the fields. They would have to burn their property. And so what would happen is, is that the snakes, they weren't very fast. And so the fire would inevitably catch up with them. And it would burn them up. The picture here of this, of this fire is judgment. And what he's saying is that you vipers, you little snakes that people are grabbing and you're biting in, you're putting into them, and you're putting that poison into them. He says, you will not escape the judgment that's coming for you. You will not escape it. You can't slither your way out of this one. He says that they're a brood of vipers. A brood of vipers, that means they're baby vipers. It's almost like a your mama joke. Because, <laughs> you know, what breeds vipers? A viper. Saying your mama's a viper. I thought it was funny. Anyway. <laughs> then he says, you keep going. Follow this progression. And he says this. And yet we still see the gracious hand of God. He says, I send you prophets and wise men and scribes, some of whom you will kill and crucify. And some of you will flog in your synagogue and persecute from town to town. Even in the midst of all of this, God's still sending messengers. God's still being gracious in offering grace, the offer of free grace by a by sovereign God. I don't know about you, but I'd be like, Fool me once, shame on you. Fool me twice, shame on me. No more grace. But he says here, and you will. We know that the apostles died deaths outside of John, died martyrs' deaths. Most of them before the year 70 A.D. But he says here, he says, your father says, you keep following in your father's footsteps, thinking yourself to be righteous, thinking yourself to be keeping this. And then as I send my prophets, as I send the wise men, as I send the scribes, and you kill them, you keep on, you keep doing that. Why not? Because your fathers did it. They shed, they shed the blood on the earth, the blood of the righteous Abel. What is he saying is, is that right, the righteousness of Abel all the way to the blood of Zechariah, the son of Berechiah, whom you murdered. What's he referring to here? He's referring, obviously, to the first martyr of right for righteousness' sake in Abel. And 2 Chronicles accounts for us Zechariah. And here he says the father uh, or the son of Berechiah. That doesn't mean necessarily his direct father. It means an ancestor. uh, Berechiah was an ancestor of him. And he says all the way 2 Chronicles is, is viewed as being the last book of the law and the prophets. And so literally what he's saying is from A to Z, there have been martyrs for righteousness. And you have actively engaged and participated in it. 
So let me, let me just um, go to conclusion here. Because I wrestled with, okay, this is very harsh. Jesus has been very patient and very nurturing with his disciples. He's been loving to those who would come to him and seek healing. He would even be patient at times and listen to the request and the dialogue of the religious leaders. Jesus now is in the mid part of his last week of earthly ministry before his crucifixion. So this twist, there's an urgency here. The Pharisees and the scribes have already decided they're not going to try to debate with him anymore. They've lost every single time. So how do we take this and pull this into our lives today? Can I ask you three questions, okay? It's a great practice whenever you kind of get stuck in a text. Anywhere in the scriptures, okay? Um, Tim Keller uh, cited this and gave, and gave this counsel. Ask these three questions. What does this tell us about God? What does this tell us about ourselves? And how does this draw us closer to Jesus? What does it tell us about God? We see in this text that God is truth. And he is passionate about truth. We see that God is patient in this text. We see God is just. God is sovereign. God is all-knowing. God is merciful. God is beautiful and life-giving. God is pure. And God is faithful. What does this tell us about ourselves? I think three things probably that stick out the most for me in regards to this. Number one, that the, that the hearts of humans are instinctively hard towards God. Think about it. If there was anyone who should have been soft and tender towards Jesus, it should have been the Pharisees and the scribes. And yet, with all the data, with all the prophecy, with all the study, they were hard. Spiritually hard. Number two, I think that we also see that the minds of humans can easily be misled. Because what did he say he called them? He called them blind what? Gods. What did he say about those who would actually, I mean, he wasn't saying that they're just out in the street and they weren't like Jeremiah that went out and was a weeping prophet and nobody listened. No, they had people coming in and following these laws and revering them. I think we see here something to be said of ourselves is that our minds can easily be misled. Number three, that the systems of humans are easily corruptible. I think that if we're honest, we can see the progression of the Pharisees. We need to understand they didn't start that way. They started as a religious group that were to pastor and to love God's people. But their systems that they kept putting in place became corruptible, to corrupt over time. So, what, do, what does it tell us about God? God's amazing. And that we should be in awe of Him. And that He is just. What does it tell us about ourselves? That we are depraved. And the systems that we put in place are susceptible to our depravity. But number three, and this is why we gather today. How does this draw us closer to Jesus? If I were to just put it into a phrase with one exclamation point on the end, I would say we need a Savior, not a system. 
A Savior that brings people to the door and is credentialed to open the door. We need a Savior that approaches the needy but prays for the vulnerable. Not praise on the vulnerable. Praise and makes intercession for the vulnerable. We need a Savior that not only converts, but works with the Spirit to sanctify outsiders into His image. We need a Savior that promotes truth and creates in us a desire to be honest and consistent. We need a Savior that is graciously patient on the minors. And sovereignly points us to stay focused on the majors. We need a Savior that is pure both outwardly and inwardly. We need a Savior that offers both beauty and life. And I would say lastly, we need a Savior that sees our history and changes our future. You see, I'm all about order and structure, guides and processes, those of you who know me. But we have enough systems in this world. The world has enough systems. But that isn't the hope for this world. We need a Savior. We need the one that can take our sinful state of woe. And turn it into blessed. And we see this in the very heart of Jesus. Because it brings us back to the text as I close. Imagine with me the harshness, the passion that Jesus has just said. And Jesus pausing. And then looking into Jerusalem. And saying, Jerusalem, oh Jerusalem. He could have said so many things about Jerusalem. The, the, the city of peace, the one with an astounding legacy, the one that held the temple of Solomon. These cities that kings... His kings dwelt at. But no, Jesus attributes it to a place who murders the prophets. Kills the prophets and stones them who were sent to you. How often Think about what he says here, please. Don't miss this. He didn't say, how often did I? He says, how often would I? Would I gather your children together? As a hen gathers her brood under her wings, and you were not willing. He says, your pattern is this. My hand has been stretched out, even as it says in the Proverbs. I have stretched forth my hand, Psalm 1, he says, and you would not. I have called, and you would not listen, and you would regard not. See, now, future, your house is left to desolate. For I tell you, You will not see me again until you say, Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Citing here that when the Son of Man comes, most believe that he's referring to A.D. 70. Whenever Jerusalem would be left desolate, destroyed by the Romans, where the blood would flow out of the city like streams. And here, the people, in a public sense, he is pointing them to this place. He said, but you will see the Son of Man again. Romans 19 says this, Then I saw heaven opened, and behold, a white horse, and one sitting on it is called Faithful and True. 
and in righteousness he judges and makes war. His eyes are like a flame of fire, and on his head are many diadems. And he has a name written no one knows but himself, and he clothed in a robe dipped in blood, and named by which he is called the Word of God. There's the identifier. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And the armies of heaven, arrayed in fine linen, white and pure, were followed, following him on white horses. And from his mouth comes sharp sword, when which strikes down the nations. And he will rule them with a rod of iron. And he will tread the winepress of the fury of the wrath of God the Almighty. And Hebrews tells us this in chapter 9 verse 28. So Christ was once offered to bear the sins of many unto them that look for him. He shall appear a second time without sin unto salvation. Jesus says, you may be running me out of Israel. You may be running me out of Jerusalem. But you need to understand this earth is mine. And even you, Jerusalem... One day we'll join all the nations. And what did Paul say? And at the name of Jesus, every knee will bow. And every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. So how do we take this today? Please hear this. God has sovereignly and graciously confronted our natural inclinations to challenge His redemptive plan by seeking to elevate our righteousness and ambitions through religion. What does that mean? That means He's confronting the fact every time you feel the inclination to make yourself feel a little bit better than someone else or a little bit worthy of His grace. He is confronting that today. And oftentimes, how do we do that? Through our religious practices. Please heed the warning of Jesus. Here's your application. Pause and reflect on the religious and cultural activities that you so passionately are about. Reflect on them. Remember, here in this text, Jesus didn't condemn them for their traditions. He condemned them for why they were doing them. The cost is too high to disregard this warning for Jesus or to take it lightly. Not only is this religious system that we spoke of today deceitful, but it is damning to your soul and those around you who embrace its claims. Repent and believe in Jesus as your only hope. Today, as I cite often, because it's going to be a while before I'm able to cite it again, what should be your heart's cry? My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. We need a Savior, not a system. Let's pray together. Father, Thank you for the time in your word. Lord, I pray that we have done our due diligence. I pray, God, that we have come with open minds and open hearts. Lord, humble, not because we're perfect. Lord, acknowledging our imperfection and our need for you. I pray today that if there's an unbeliever here that maybe has bought in to the lie that their righteousness is enough. I pray, God, today that their eyes will be open and their ears will hear the truth that has been preached, the gospel of good news, that we are sinners because we rejected your authority and we ratify that choice every single day. And we need a Savior. We need not only a crucified Savior, we need a risen Savior. We need one who has been vindicated. We need Jesus and we believe wholeheartedly as a church one day you will return. 
And we will be joint heirs with you. And you will right all the wrongs. And there will be no sadness nor sorrow. But that is for those who have received your promise and your blessing. For Lord, we pray that it will be sobering for us to hear these woes. But let us rest in the blessed. And we pray this in the name of Jesus. Amen. Let's stand together. As you go into this world, hear this blessing. May the presence of the triune God be evident, felt, and known in your heart and in your mind. May the Father's sovereign hand bless you as you labor this week. May the Son's scarred hands remind you that you are loved. And may the Spirit's voice guide you as you journey. This is a promise that has already been given because God is faithful and He will keep it. So go with confidence, child of God. You are His. And there is absolutely nothing that can change that. And the people of God said, Amen, you're dismissed.